Hello, everyone, and welcome to the MIFA podcast. My name is Jonathan Hughes. And I'm Julie Shields Rutina. It's our first show of the new year, and there's no better way to start a new year than by talking about the college search. So beginning of the road, so to speak, right, for everybody. This is a show for students who are just beginning to think about where they might want to go to college or what they might want to do. Uh, It's a show of limitless possibilities. So one of our favorite guests is returning, Drew Carter, who's the Deputy Director of Admission at Holy Cross. And he's going to join us to reveal his five secrets for finding the perfect college. So what else do I need to say? You'll want to hear that. But Julie, who's on deck before Drew? So glad you asked. Well, since Drew will talk about the college search, we thought, why not talk about MIFA Pathway, MIFA's college and career portal, and all that it has to offer students who are just beginning the college search search process. So we're pleased to welcome back to the show one of our favorite guests, MIFA Pathway Director Jennifer Bento-Pinion. Hi, Jen. Welcome back to the MIFA podcast. Hi. Happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Okay, so Jen, so here at MIFA, we're used to having a timeline in our heads for students, you know, and and sort of what they might want to be thinking about when and sharing what students can do each season as they navigate through the college admissions and and financial aid process. So we're used to hearing specific questions about financial aid, for example, from students and, and their families who are in their senior year of high school, right? And then so we're used to also having questions about the college admissions process starting in students junior year. Can you tell us when does the college search really begin for students? Uh, So who are we talking to? Sure, such a good question. Uh, The college search process itself uh, can be very long and it really is going to be different for each student. Uh, Some students may be looking at colleges in their senior year of high school. Some may be starting to look in their freshman year or even earlier than that, so that then they have their college list finalized in their junior year. I think it definitely depends on the student. Uh, So MIFA Pathway has offerings for students as young as middle school. And so I think it makes sense to start there. Uh, One of the first things that students can do in MIFA Pathway at the middle school level is to take part in fun activities within the discovery zone that highlight things such as what they like to do, what they're good at, subjects that they enjoy in school, and where their strengths and interests lie. Uh, This can lead them to the college search tools that are available in MIFA Pathway. So students can really start the process of getting to know themselves very early on. And these activities can be the building blocks of a potential career path. Uh, This is different from a defined sort of college search, but knowing your strengths, your interests, your talents, and what you value is really the beginning of the journey and MIFA Pathway can help with that. Oh, that's so great, Jen. So, okay, so that's the very beginning of the process. And I think, I hope a lot of students can take advantage of that, um, especially in middle school. But what about students who are a bit older, high school students? What does MIFA Pathway have to help with those, those searches for high school students? Sure. So uh, we know that when looking at colleges, many factors come into play and some students may have a definite idea of what is important to them early on, but many do not. Uh, And MIFA Pathway can can help sort through this. At the high school level, MIFA Pathway has two different ways students can explore colleges. Typically, the younger students start with the Match Me feature that allows a student to go through a number of colorful interactive pages where they select criteria that they would like to apply to their search. So this includes geographic location. Uh, Do they wanna stick close to home or go across the country? Uh, The size of the college, do they wanna be in a small intimate school or a large school? Uh, The setting, do they wanna be in a city or prefer to be in a more suburban setting? They can even add an area of study if they want to narrow down the results even further. Then a list of colleges is generated and based on, based upon that criteria that was selected. So it can be broad or quite specific based on what the student chooses. From that list of colleges, the student can then click on a school they would like to learn more about. So this brings them to uh, a college details page that are, it's quite extensive and students can get a good feel if a college may be one they would consider applying to. So this is why this beginning process is so important. 
uh, the details, pages, outline, um, majors and degrees offered, tuition information, special programs, admissions information, student body information, maybe athletics that are offered at the, at the institution. Uh, also included is a link to the college's website and even a link to the college's uh, net price calculator. Uh, so this is helpful in determining the financial fit of a college. Uh, any colleges that students want to explore further or maybe even consider applying to, these can be saved uh, to their My College list. So this is a great way for students com to compile the colleges and then go back to assess those that they will actually apply to later on. We've talked a lot about college, uh, but I also want to mention that MIFA Pathway isn't just for college, but it's for career readiness, right? Um, so what tools do we have for students who may not be sure that you know, college is right for them? College is not for all students. Uh, it, every student's path is different. MIFA Pathway is exceptional in the way that the platform embraces all types of future plans and students have so many viable, sustainable options, you know, whether that's pursuing a short-term certification program, starting at a community college and transferring to a four-year institution, uh, possibly going into the military or directly into the workplace. So MIFA Pathways career search features allows the student to generate a list of careers to explore based on a number of different criteria, whether that's education level, uh, career category. Students can even apply their top interests, values, and skills from the assessments to the search. Uh, similar to the college search, uh, students apply that crit criteria that's specific to them to determine the possibility of pursuing a particular direction, and they can create a list of careers that might be of interest. So this can begin at the middle school level within those discovery zone features, as I previously mentioned. So the details pages for all the careers offers extensive information where the students can learn more about a career they may want to add to their careers li list for future consideration. Uh, this may include uh, 10 year projected growth statistics, programs of study needed, education and programs that are required, skills needed, uh, it outlines daily tasks and activities, uh, even related careers. So another area I'll mention for students to explore are the, the four features within our Investigate Your Future. So these features support uh, current and future labor market information where students can view uh, trending skills and occupations in today's market, growth potential and geographic concentration of selected careers, all of which can also help students determine the direction they may go. What a great tool. Oh. Love me for pathway. So can you talk about how students can take advantage of this? How do they get started with me for pathway? Sure. Uh, super easy, quick and easy. Uh, me for pathway is available to all students in grades six through 12. Uh, so students just go on to me for and select I'm a student. And then from there, they click on a uh, first time user. Well, they will be brought to a page where they will uh, put in their name, their birth date, the town, that they live in and the school that they attend. Uh, they do have to create a, a username and a password and they do have to have a working email address to register. And this is just in case uh, they need to reset their password and we know this happens. Uh, so they also identify their year of graduation. This is so the system can provide suggested activities based upon their grade level, which is really cool. So they check off the terms and conditions box and they're in. Uh, so that when they log in, they will see their dashboard, which will help guide them through those suggested activities within the platform. All right, Jim. Well, thank you so much. Uh, it's always great to hear about everything that MIFA Pathway does because I know it's always growing and it's, it's always exciting to hear. Now it's time to move to the MIFA mailbag. So these are questions that have come into us over the past weeks and been answered by our college planning team. So remember, if you have any questions, you can email us at collegeplanning@mifa.org. You can call us at 1-800-449-MIFA, or you can reach us over social media on Facebook, that's MIFA MA, on Twitter, that's at MIFA Tweets, and on Instagram, that's MIFA underscore MA. Our question today comes to us from Matthew, who writes, I have a question about how to answer two vague questions on the CSS profile. Sounds like it's going to be a good one already. These questions are... How much did the parent earn from work in 2021? And how much did the other parent earn from work in 2021? What do they mean by earn? What exact income 
do we, do we report? This is such a, a good representative question of, from the CSS profile from parents about the CSS profile. So Julie, what should the answer be? Yes, and I'm so glad we're covering this because it seems especially this year, I personally have received this question often and I know you have too. It seems like a big one. So I'll just say that, yes, a lot of people are confused by this. Second, the question is asked on the FAFSA and the CSS profile. So I think people are confused on both sometimes. Um, and it makes it comes after people have already put a lot of other income information in there and maybe on the FAFSA even use the IRS data retrieval tool. So they feel like I've put my income in there. Why am I now being asked this question in another way? So really what this, but, but just know you're not doing anything wrong. This is a separate question. And what they're looking for here is income from work rather than passive income, say from an investment or something like that. So basically they're looking for um, the line on the IRS form 1040 line one, which comes right from the W-2. So it's the W-2 income they like and they want and broken out by each parent. So they want that broken out. And just to get a little more detailed, I'll go slowly on this to say this. So that's the main income they want. But here are the other types of income that also should be added in there for each separate parent. So IRS form 1040 NR line one A, that's another type of income that would get added in there. Also schedule one, lines three and six and schedule k1 which is irs form 1065 minus box 14 code a so a lot of people aren't going to have all of that other information but so mainly it's going to be the earned income from your w-2 but all of those other pieces, if you have them, can be added in there and again, broken out by each parent separately. Wow, Julie, thank you very much for that very detailed answer. And one more time, if you have any questions, you can email us at collegeplanning at mifa.org. Call us at 800-449-MIFA. Facebook is MIFA MA. Twitter at MIFA tweets. Instagram, MIFA underscore. MA. Just remember, we have a bench of college guidance experts that are waiting to answer your questions for free. So now let's go to my talk with College of the Holy Cross's Deputy Director of Admission, Drew Carter, and his five secrets to finding the right school. Drew Carter is the Deputy Director of Admissions at College of the Holy Cross, and this is his second appearance on the show. Last year, we discussed five things that high school juniors can do to strengthen their college applications, and it was great. So if that topic is relevant to you, you can go back and listen to that on our feed. You'll see that Drew has great things to say, as always, and an invaluable perspective. So we know we needed Drew to come back to the show and talk to us again. So first of all, Drew, welcome back to the MIFA podcast. Thanks, Jonathan. It's great to be here, and thanks for reminding me about that prior um, episode we did on this uh, podcast series. It's, um, I think actually those two things kind of go hand in hand. They focus on different things, but I hadn't thought about how the two of them are good sort of like partner episodes. Yeah. Yeah. It was one of my favorite, you know, episodes that we did. So I definitely recommend that everybody go and, and listen to it. Um, but why don't you tell the folks what topic we're going to be discussing today? Yeah. So today we're going to talk about uh, five secrets. Um, uh, to finding the right college. And these are things that I think uh, sometimes we in the, the world of college admissions really understand are really important uh, for students and families looking at uh, looking for the right college. But sometimes when you're in the middle of it, it's hard to recognize um, what things uh, you should be focused on. So these are my my five little secrets. And, and I say secrets because sometimes they're not readily available or readily apparent to families going through the process. Okay, so right off the bat, before we get into the top five, uh, who is this for? 
So what what age or grade? Who are we talking to uh, or addressing here with with these tips? Yeah, I mean, these all of these are messages that I use when talking to ninth graders, tenth graders, eleventh graders, and gosh, even sometimes uh, to seniors in in as late as December of their senior year. I think certainly the most appropriate time, the ideal time to hear this message would be, um, or to be really acting on this message would be probably during the end of your sophomore year or well through your junior year of high school. But I I gave a good portion of this talk to a group of seniors just a couple of weeks ago. Um, there are bits and pieces in here that are great for starting the college search process, but also in a lot of ways could be very good to making a decision at the very end of the timeline when you've got options about schools you've been admitted to. Hmm. All right. Well, having said all that, let's go to number one. What do we have? Okay. So number one is to start with some humility. And um, I think so often we see students, um, especially high school sophomores and juniors, and even as early as the start of their senior year, they're asked so many questions by the adults in their life, uh, family members, particularly at Thanksgiving, which just happened, uh, guidance counselors, even admissions officers like myself. And these um, high school students are asked so many questions by these people about college and about their preferences and choices and desires for colleges. And often high school students are filling in answers to these questions where answers maybe don't yet exist. And these are questions like, do you want to go to a big school or a small school? Do you want to stay near to home or go far away? What do you want to study when you go to college? And students fill in answers to these questions, um, often I think because they think they're supposed to know the answers. Um, you know, they're supposed to know the answers because they hear their friends giving answers to these questions. And so many adults are asking them that I think students feel like they're supposed to know the answers. And so often when answers don't yet exist, students don't feel like it's appropriate that an answer doesn't exist. So they fill in an answer. They say, I want to study political science and I want to go to a big school. And so my first secret really is to um, for students to own the I don't know. And, you know, if I were speaking to parents, I would say really strongly encourage the I don't know. Um, I don't know is often the authentic, honest answer to some of these questions. Um, and when students say, I don't know, they're giving a piece of information back to the adults in their life, whether it's family members or guidance counselors or admissions professionals. Um, but I do want to put a stipulation on this. I really encourage students to say, I don't know if it's the authentic answer, but you cannot put a period at the end of, I don't know. <laughs> when you put a period at the end of, I don't know, in a conversation like this, adults can sometimes feel uh, like they've run into a roadblock. You know, if your parents and your counselor say, do you want to go to big school or a small school? And you say, I don't know. Well, what do you want to study when you go to college? I don't know. Well, that's when frustration ensues in the part of the adult. So instead of putting a period at the end of I don't know, put a comma at the end of I don't know, and then say something that you do know. Uh, and I'll give you an example. So let's imagine that um, a guidance counselor or an admissions counselor or even a family member says to a student, well, do you want to go to a big school or a small school? If the student doesn't really know yet, I think they should say, I don't know, comma, but my cousin is at Clemson and that's a really big school. So, and she likes it. So maybe I would investigate big schools or the, the opposite could be, I don't know if I want to go to a big school or a small school, comma, but my English class is my favorite class right now. And there's only 17 students in that class. So I might be more comfortable in a smaller environment. So what we get there with an answer like that is a student sort of authentically representing themselves by saying they don't know, but then giving some information to the adults, whether it's family members or counselors or admissions professionals, giving them some information, some insight into their thinking. And that um, gives them information that they can help that student with and really uh, help advise that student on the next step so they can move that I don't know to a set of list and preferences and, and hopes and desires that may develop later in the timeline. So start with hum humility encourage and own the I don't know. And I think you'll be students will be set for a much more successful early part of the college search timeline. That's such a good point. I always feel like the luckiest students are the ones who have a good idea of what they want to study. Mm -hmm. and, you know, if somebody is lucky enough to have a pronounced interest, like one of the students that I talked to on the show knew that she loved 
biology and marine biology and really wanted to study that. And I said, well, that's, you know, very, very lucky of you to have something that you know you're interested in and that really can, can spur you on. But I was very much, you know, in, in, in this camp. And I think the reality is, is like, like the student you mentioned who, yeah, the student you mentioned who knows they want to study marine bio, that can sometimes put pressure on the other students who feel like they're behind in the process if they don't know. But understand that that student who one day may be so sure of what they think they want to study may very well change their mind the next day, the next week, the next month. So um, so be open to the I don't know. Understand that this is a process and understand that you you are you will embark on a much more successful process if you answer authentically, I don't know when that's the authentic answer. Um, okay, so that's number one, be open to the I don't know. What's the second tip? So the second piece is really uh, kind of a follow-up to that first piece. And it's a follow-up to the idea that we as adults are, are asking so many questions of students. Do you want to go to a big school or a small school? Would you want to study near to home, far away? Um, and I think so often these are presented as binary options to students and they have to choose. Uh, I like big schools or small schools. Um, I want to go far away or I want to stay near to home. The reality, though, is that high school students are much more nuanced than that. And the college search process is much more nuanced. It is quite possible that a student could be happy at a big school and a small school. I was the kind of student who was going to be happy most anywhere. I would have been quite comfortable at a large university or a small college. Um, and so. I, I think it's important for students to um, to not see the college search options as, as binary, to be open to the possibility that you be, might be comfortable at a big school and a small school, far away or near to home. And both of those could match with your personality. Now, some students are easily going to fall into a category where they will only be comfortable in one of the two options. But there's a great number of students out there who would be comfortable, if not happy, if not thrive in either of the options that are presented to them. So I think as adults, we need to shy away from making students choose an option, big, small, near, far, uh, on campus, off campus. And I think as, as high school students, um, high school students really need to um, be okay with the idea that they could be happy at both options that are presented them when it comes to types of schools or locations or, or residential uh, environments. So uh, try not to minimize and, and make the process, the search process so binary. Be open to the idea that, you know, we're wonderfully nuanced and complex uh, humans and that it's really possible that some of us would be happy and thrive in a variety of different environments. And so what would you recommend then for students to find out, you know, what are those, some of the best ways to find out where you would be happy or if you would be happy in both environments? Yeah. I mean, I think some of the things that uh, students have found, have done to find themselves most successful is really to provide exposure. Um, and that comes from talking to people that comes from visiting campuses. Um, there's lots of different ways that, um, you know, sometimes I use the, the example of of buying a couch that, that that I did many years ago. And really, gosh, the only way you start to get a list of your preferences, because when I entered the uh, furniture store, the salesperson said, what kind of couch are you looking for? I didn't know there were kinds of couches, number one. <laughs> and number two, I didn't know what the possible options were. Um, what was important for me was just frankly, to sit on a whole bunch of couches. <laughs> and uh, I think for students, sometimes that, you know, sitting on couches, the equivalent can be talking to friends or family members, in-person visits, virtual visits, just a variety of different uh, exposures so that you can start to understand what your own preferences might be. All right. I remember going to visit my brother at Syracuse University and big school, you know, and, and a huge campus. Basically, to me, I know Syracuse is a city outside of it, but it seemed like everything was the was the university. And I thought, mm, I don't think so. So it was it was a great opportunity for me to know I wanted to be in a place that had a, a city around it that wasn't part of, of the college. Um, and, and that played a big role in, in, you know, sort of accumulating my list of schools. So yeah. it, it was very lucky to be able to have that experience. Now, number three, moving on. 
Yeah. So my third one is really to, my third secret is really for families and students to, to try, do their best to avoid minimizing schools into sound bites. Um, you know, I think what the, one of the big challenges that families and students are faced with is that, you know, they start this college search process and with the internet, you're so, there's so many schools um, that are available for your sort of internet consumption. There's, you know, close to 4,000 four-year colleges and universities in the U.S. And you have to start to understand schools in some ways. And so I think our instinct is to say, oh, gosh, Syracuse is the school for communications. <laughs> and uh, gosh, Emerson is the school just for actors. And this school is just for that. And what we're trying to do is understand what that school is like. And I think often we try to minimize uh, schools into sort of like digestible sound bites when the reality is, is that schools are much more complex than that. And in some ways, when I'm saying students are much more complex, uh, colleges and universities are much more complex. There are many students really happy at Syracuse not studying communications. <laughs> there are wonderful students at Emerson who are not actors, who are quite successful and happy. Um, so I think to to try to avoid this sort of minimizing of colleges and also at the same time to challenge some assumptions. Um, gosh, my uncle went to Wake Forest and and he's an executive, so everyone there must be interested in business. That's not necessarily true. Um, that's a, a tag I've placed onto that college because of what little exposure I've had from my uncle, who's an executive. But the reality is, is that there are many students at Wake Forest studying other things who see other possible careers. Now, this is a little bit of a challenge because I'm saying dive deeper, <laughs> learn more and go beyond uh, some of the sound bites and the assumptions that we have built uh, in a way to really just help us understand colleges. But I think what we will find is that it's um, because these colleges are much more complex than we've assumed. Uh, I'm also saying our students are much more complex than we've assumed. That's when we really can get closer to fit, because what you might find is that student looking for a big school who's not interested in communications, but really likes upstate New York, if they've challenged their assumptions, they might end up at Syracuse, understanding that it's not just a school for students interested in studying communications. Yeah, I think that's great. And, and I, I think now is the point, because your first three points really dealt with keeping options open and, and sort of broadening your search or broadening your, your horizons in terms of the colleges uh, that you could be looking at and not limiting yourself. Um, and then I think the question becomes, and I think we get into it in, in the next tip, is how we then start to go and, and assess those colleges. Yeah, I mean, it, my, my fourth secret is exposure matters. And I go back to that example of me going to the, the furniture store and the salesperson saying, you know, what, what are you here for? And I said, a couch. And they said, what kind of couch? And I think I pretended I got a phone call on my cell phone because I was uncomfortable. I like, I didn't know, I couldn't even guess at an answer because I didn't know the possible answers. But the reality is, is that by the time I got to the 12th or 13th furniture store and I walked in and they said, what are you here for? And I said, a couch. And they said, what kind of couch? I said, well, 94 inches. I want corduroy. I want the chase reversible option. I want the extra cushion. And I want the piping on the sides. And the only reason I knew all those things about myself and I knew about all the possible answers was because I'd been willing to be clueless. <laughs> I'd been okay with, with the not knowing. And I had been willing to just sit on a ton of couches. And, you know, for the college search experience, the good news is that there's so many new ways now to provide this sort of experience. Um, you know, reading about couches isn't that successful. You really kind of need to sit on them. And for colleges, I think there is things to learn. There are things to learn online from virtual tours and webinars and gosh, email correspondence, whether it's with admissions professionals or with current students. Um, and there are certainly a lot of ways where you can learn about schools in person, whether it's an official campus visit uh, with a tour or an information session, uh, maybe an open house program. Um, but sometimes, you know, I think we we place such a high priority on these official visits. I think we overlook sometimes just the you know, you're sometimes you're just on the way home from grandma's house and you're on the highway and you see a sign that says this college, this exit, and you just get off and drive around and walk around for 10 minutes. All of that exposure matters. Sometimes it's about learning about that particular college, 
But remember, as a student in the college search process, you're learning about yourself just as much, if not more. You have to build that sort of vocabulary and set of list of preferences for yourself. And the unsuccessful visit can do as much um, toward moving you in the direction of your perfect college, your fit college, your dream college, as the successful visit. Um, and sometimes you don't know what kind of couch you want until you sit on the couch that you don't want. Um, and so while I want a job in admissions, I want you to come for the official campus tours. Be open to the quick drive by, the 10 minute walk around, the self visit on a Sunday afternoon on the way home from a theater performance or a lacrosse game. Uh, those matter too. Uh, all this exposure is just accumulating and going toward developing a vocabulary and a set of list and preferences. So exposure matters and look for it in all ways, both online, in person, official, and unofficial. All right. So let's wrap it up with the final tip. All right. So we often see students uh, coming to campus um, for that official visit, right? That campus tour. And not too long ago, um, I uh, came up into our main office, main admission office at the Holy Cross, and I saw a list of uh, a group of families waiting in line, waiting to talk to our uh, receptionist who happened to be on the phone at the time. And so I jumped in just to see if there's any way I could help. And, you know, lots of them had copies of the Boston Globe and the New York Times that, that they had come to campus with that day. And uh, most of the families had just gone on the campus tour and they were looking for recommendations for a great place to eat off campus in Worcester. And we have great restaurants in Worcester, so I had many recommendations for them. But my fifth secret is this. If you've spent the time to travel to that campus, to visit, eat the food on campus, and read the student newspaper. In those two small experiences, you will learn more about student life than you did on the website, on the campus tour, or the information session. And I say that because, not necessarily because the food matters. And gosh, I think food at every college right now is great. The food, the level of food on college university campuses is just so high right now. So I don't really think the food matters so much, but that when you go to a place on a college campus where food is served to college students, what you see is the announcements for the clubs and activities that weekend. You see the signups for intramural volleyball. You see the way students are talking to each other. You witness living and breathing student life. It is like going into the, the lion's cage at the zoo. You get a real experience to be an observer inside the moment. Um, and I think you learn more from eating that muffin and drinking that smoothie at the coffee shop in the student center. You learn more about student life in those few moments than you necessarily might from a campus tour or an information session. And that second piece, you know, in the admissions world, we're going to hand you these glossy brochures, most of which are written by, a, you know, marketing companies. We're going to mail them to you. Um, but the reality is, is that the student newspaper at each college and university those are college students talking to each other about the things that matter to them on their campus. So if you make the time to visit a college campus, I strongly encourage you to make the time to eat the food while you're there and to read the student newspaper. That's where you get true insight into what student life is like. If you're talking with somebody right at the very beginning of this process, what's a good place for them to start their search? And then one more question too, which is if you're the parent of a child who doesn't know the answers to the questions of what kind of school do you want to go to? Where do you want to go? What do you want to study, et cetera? Um, what's the best thing that you can do? Okay. Let me start with that second one first, right? Uh, Cause it can be frustrating as adults when we keep asking our teenagers questions and their response is, I don't know. I don't know. Um, so two pieces of advice for those parents. First, encourage them to put a comma at the end of that, I don't know, and then to say something they do know. But also, this is going to sound strange because I'm a parent as well, but stop asking so many questions early in the timeline and just encourage and to help provide exposure. Get your children sitting on couches, provide them the exposure so that they can start to understand um, all of the options and that what their taste and preferences might be. Remember, we're asking students for what their preferences are in an experience they've never had before. Imagine a student who's never driven a car, has only ridden a bike, and we say, what's your favorite kind of car? So we need to get them 
to provide them exposure. So fewer questions by the parents early in the timeline and assist with the exposure. Um, and your first question was really about how to start, you know, to a student who's in ninth or 10th grade. I will say that um, I do a lot of interviews throughout the fall and, and early part of the winter with high school seniors. And one question I ask every student is, what advice would you give to a student just starting the college search process, knowing what you know now? Uh, I've asked that question for about 18 or 19 years now, and I've only gotten one answer in response. Every single student who I've ever asked, thousands of students, has always said, I wish I started visiting schools earlier. I think uh, families so often hesitate because they say, well, I don't know where my child could get in. I don't know what's a good school or not. We don't have, and I just, I think so often we're putting the cart before the horse. Let's just see this as exposure and not necessarily worry about what schools you're looking or what schools you've decided to do a quick visit, I say, like, find the closest college <laughs> and do a 20-minute walk around. It's not necessarily to determine if that school is right for your child in ninth or 10th grade. It's to start to give your child exposure to the college environment so they can start to build up that vocabulary and start to develop a list of preferences. Um, it's just another couch they're sitting on so that they can, over time, accumulate enough visits, enough sits, that they can identify their own preferences, because this is as much a sort of a self-discovery as it is college and university discovery. Well, that's great. I mean, I'm not sure I can do better than that. I know when I was a, a student in high school, uh, I had no problem sitting on couches. So um, that, that was good for me. But Drew, thank you so much. I really enjoyed this yet again, and I can't wait to have you back for a third time. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, good luck to everybody in the, this college search uh, period of time. And um, this is this can be, a, like I think, a, a period of time with, with great discovery, but also great enjoyment and great fun. So I think uh, the more we can keep this as a fun period of time, the more buy-in we'll get from our high school students. I agree. Thanks so much, Drew. Thanks, Jonathan. All right, folks. Well, that about wraps it up for us. Jennifer Bento Opinion, thank you for being here with us. Thanks for having me. I also want to thank Drew Carter for sharing his time and his expertise with us. And folks, remember, if you liked what you heard today and you want to know more about planning, saving, and paying for college and career readiness, you can follow us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, wherever you get your podcasts. And please remember to review us. It helps us to keep doing what we're doing and getting this show out to folks like you. So, Julie, thank you once again. Thank you, Jonathan. I also want to thank Sean Connolly, our producer, and AJ Yi for his assistance in posting the show. And once again, my name is Jonathan Hughes, and this has been the MIFA Podcast. Thanks.